table is going to pray over the request and then put them in the little basket, okay? And those of you that are live on Facebook, if you'd like to send your request, uh, Cheryl's writing them down so they'll be added together. Lord, you know there's power in prayer. You know there's power when we come together in prayer. So as our saints are writing down their requests and their praises, and those online are putting theirs together, we know that you hear us, Lord. We know that you already know what we're asking. And we thank you that they're already answered. I want to add, too, uh, Dr. Bishop's patient, his first initial is D. He's in desperate need of an antibiotic, and Medicare needs to approve this and pay for it for him. So you know the needs, Lord. Um, I pray for my cousin Jim in Toledo that died and for his family, and a cousin Nora in California that's battling cancer. Um, I pray that you send your healing quickly and fully in Jesus' name. All right, I'd like at each table to just take a second, bow your heads, and let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for each person at these tables. We thank you that we're never alone at Table of Grace because we have the camaraderie of people that we meet as we come in these doors. We praise you for this church. We praise you for what you're doing. We praise you for your power, your love. We praise you for what you've put on my heart that I will begin to teach today and go on until you tell me to stop. Amen. We praise you, Lord, for each and everything. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. amen. All right, now, you guys have a lot of homework today. Does everyone have one of these? And if you're looking online, we're going to start teaching on this for probably weeks. Yes. It's called God's Creative Power Will Work For You. If you need one of these and you're online, uh, Cheryl, my techie over there, put the address of the church. Just send us a request. If you want to send a donation with it, that'd be great. Everybody that, I want you to take a book and put your name in it right now so you don't lose it. It's yours. And then if you want to put a donation in the basket toward the books, that would be great. But I don't want you to worry. If you don't have the money, the books are yours. And then in a minute, uh, the ushers will come through in a little bit and collect that. So we keep it separate from the tithes. Okay? So everybody's got your book. Bring it each week along with your Bible, and we'll... We're going to delve in it. If you notice, my name tag's on upside down, and nobody asked me. And the reason is because we're going to delve in this book every week. We're going to pull stuff out. We're going to go inside, outside, and upside down, okay? So God bless you. All right. God's truth for each of us. All truth is God's truth. I want you to sit there and think about that. All truth is God's truth. So what's the opposite of truth? Pardon? A lie. So who does that belong to? Right. The devil is a liar, and he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Am I? Are you with me? So now let's break that up a little bit. If the devil's a liar and all truth is God's, then when we proclaim things that are not written in God's word, who are we proclaiming? Right. We're giving power to something that has no power without us giving it to him. Make sense? Yes. Okay, so what happens? We start to create a power 
that we're seeing in this world. How many of you think the world is just perfect the way it is? Cheryl, span the room so Facebook can see. How many, stand up if you think God's power is evident in the world today. Do you see it? Okay. Why? Because we're proclaiming what we see, which is a lie, because the devil's put it in our mind and we're buying into it, we proclaim it. And what are we creating then? A world that is in turmoil and a mess. Does that make sense? Good. Now, let's take it further. So what happens if we start to change the words that we say? Let's say the Our Father together. You ready? I'm going to stop you at one point. Our Father, who art in heaven, is he in heaven? <laughs> hallowed be thy name. Should he be hallowed? Should he be honored? Absolutely. Do we agree? Now watch this part. Thy kingdom come. Are we asking? Jesus taught us this. Are we asking for his kingdom to come? Where? Say the next word. On earth as it is in heaven. Guess what, guys? Heaven's perfect. Jesus taught us to pray and ask that his kingdom come on earth. Do you think Jesus knew we were going to run into some obstacles down here? On earth as it is in heaven. Did Jesus say the earth is perfect? No. He told us to pray that his kingdom would come to earth as it is in heaven. So if Jesus told us that, can that happen? Absolutely. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But the will of God is not being done on earth. Why? Because we have free will. There are people that will argue and say, oh, God's will, it's always done. Then free will means nothing. Have you lived your life perfectly under the will of God? No. Nobody has? My saints here have it? Well, if the people at Table of Grace have it, nobody has, okay? I haven't either. But he taught us to say, thy will be done, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, what? Our daily bread. Oh, wait, daily bread, daily bread. But I want, but I want and you know what? I don't get what I want, so I get upset and angry, and I work harder, and I try. But that's not what Jesus taught us to pray. What did he do with the Israelites when they complained? How much manna did he give them? Enough for what? One day. One day. And what did some of them do? They hoarded it. They hoarded it, and they put it in jars, didn't they? What happened to it? It went bad. Yep. Didn't work. Jeff, say it. How's that working for you? How's that working for you? <laughs> All right. Don't you love it, guys? The reason we're not seeing what God wants is because we're not doing it right. This church is going to eat this up till we get it right. <laughs> okay? What's the next verse? Give us this day our daily bread. Uh-oh. What's the next one? Forgive us our trespasses. Oh, God forgives me. I don't have to worry. What's the next part of that? As we forgive those who trespass against us. Pastor Cindy, does God forgive me? Do you forgive others? God already did it. He already did it. He took all of it. Why are we holding people accountable for what they do wrong? Jeff, say it again. How's that working for you? How's that working for you? 
Do you see what we're doing? I love it. You guys get it. God's already forgiven you. Look at the person next to you and say, Hallelujah, God forgave me. Hallelujah. Now look in your heart and say, Hallelujah. God forgave that sandpaper person that I'm having a hard time forgiving. Right? Hallelujah. Say it. God has forgiven the sandpaper person that I'm having a hard time forgiving. Isn't it neat? Yeah. Our God's got a sense of humor. All right, now what's the next part? And lead us not where? Into temptation. Come here, Gavin. I'm going to bring up a boy that's never tempted. Never, ever tempted. This is Gavin. He's one of our leaders, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you ever get tempted? Yes, I do. Why? <laughs> can you picture a kid getting tempted? And we can pray for him not to be tempted, right? And we can pray for us not to be tempted. How do we stay from temptation? What do you think, Gavin? When you're having that fight within, what do you do? What works? Pray to God. Okay, Jeff, ask him that one. How's that working for you? Talk when you go God. to God, how does that stuff work? Not that good. If you go to God, it will work. But if you go to yourself, it doesn't work too good, does it? All right. So what do we have to do? We have to recognize what those battles are. When we recognize them, we can stop them. Because we have that power. Lead us not into temptation. Here's one of my favorite lines. Why does this church do deliverance? What did Jesus say? Deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. Isn't that cool? Did he know evil was going to come around us? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did he know you'd be standing here today? Yeah. Yeah. And guess what he said? Come to me. I'm going to deliver you from all evil. In Jesus' name. Amen. We love you, buddy. Thank you. Deliver us from all evil, for thine is the kingdom. We got to bring his kingdom down. We can do this. The power, who, where does our power come from? God. And the glory. So all glory to God, right? Forever and ever and ever. But guess what, saints? We tend to think it's us. Well, I. I'm doing really good. I, I didn't I didn't do anything wrong. I'm trying to love. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. That's not the glory to God. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever. 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 Where's heaven? Forever. You want to live heaven on earth? then you start doing what Jesus taught us to do. Amen. Sermon's over. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Everybody be happy, right? <laughs> this is what we're going to do. We are going to get in this little book, and we are going to learn God's creative power will work for you. You know why it's not working? Anybody? Because we're not doing it. Now, we're going to learn that when we say something, it creates power. Everybody has a problem with that when they first learn that. Why? Because we've all said things and created things that we really didn't want. And guess who has to take the responsibility for what comes out of their own mouth? That's not easy. Okay? So, every Wednesday night, starting this Wednesday, at 5.30, we're going to have soup, bread, and salad supper, and fellowship, and fun. So you don't have to come right at 5.30. You can come at 6.30, have a bowl of soup, and at 7 o'clock, I'm going to keep teaching this on Wednesday and Sunday. 
and Wednesday and Sunday. You know why? God filled my heart that it's time. Amen. And if you're like me, I've been teaching this often for years, and I still am not doing it right. So I know we need to practice, and we need each other. Look at those around you and say, I really need you. We need each other. So why is it important to come to church and be a part of the church? We need each other. So we're going to go. I hope my snowbirds get back quick because I'm really tired of waiting for you guys. Hurry back, okay? In October, on the 7th and the 21st, right after the service, you don't have to come an extra day, I'm going to teach why we're Wesleyan and why we come to church. And when I delved into that, it's delightful because the Wesleyan church, they, they have similarities to the Catholic. So if you came from the Catholic church like I did, you can feel at home. They have similarities to the Orthodox. They have similarities to the um, evangel evangelical. They want to go out. They're teaching us to go. How many denominations can you get into that pull in so much power? All by Jesus' word. Isn't that exciting? To me, that's a delight. And if you want to learn more about that, I'm going to teach it. And then at the end of October, we'll celebrate our second year as a church. And anybody that wants to become a member can. But if you don't, that's okay. You're still part of us. All right? Nobody's going to be forced into it. And nobody's going to be told they have to leave if they don't want to. But I'm going to give the opportunity for those that do. What do you think? You like that? Yeah. All right. So we need to be, now I want to read you this. This I got <coughs> through an email. This, And this might not shock most of you, but it, it surprised me. A new Harvard study investigated the health and mental health of children and teenagers who were related raised with religious or spiritual practices. What they found was fascinating. Now these are children that were raised going to church, okay? Those who attended services at least once a week as children or teens were about 18% more likely to report being happier in their 20s than those who never went to church. That surprised me, but I love it. So you want your kids to be happy? Yes. Bring them to church. Amen. All right, it's proven. They're, they were 30% more likely to do volunteer work. Why don't we have people out there doing volunteer work? Because nobody's coming to church and they're not bringing the kids. Look how many kids are here. One family every week. See? Get this one you're going to love. Anybody know anyone that struggles with drugs? Alcohol? 33% less likely to use drugs if you go to church. Kids will be 33% less. It doesn't mean it's foolproof, but with that Holy Spirit power that they're taught in a good Bible-believing church, they're going to have some fuel to that fire. In addition, watch this, the Bible, people who prayed and meditated individually on a daily basis, and I'm going to say if you're married and you're not doing devotions with your spouse, you're robbing yourself of something very, very precious. But if you go to God and pray and meditate daily, you're going to have more satisfaction in your life. You're going to be better able to process your emotions and you're going to be more forgiving. What did the, our father say? Forgive us as we forgive. You want to be more forgiving? Go to God every day. Now here's a nice fact. Children who go to church are less likely 
to have sex outside of marriage at an earlier age and therefore less likely to get sexually transmitted diseases. You see what's happening in the world? They're not being taught. They're not being, well, my kids don't want to go to church. You know, it's their choice. I don't want to force it on them. You're robbing your kids. You're robbing your kids of what? Remember what we started out with? Who gives us the truth? Who gives us the lies? So if you're not teaching the truth, what are they going to believe? The lie. Pretty simple, isn't it? And then we wonder what's going on. By God's design, whose design? God. Who designed this? God. A divine human partnership is essential to flourishing as a human. Anybody in here not human? Take a look. Look pretty human to me. Are you a human, Caleb? So if you want to function and flourish, who do you need? Who do humans need? God. Say it loud. God. Now, if a five-year-old knows that, I think we all know it, don't you? I'm six. Uh, that's right. You had a birthday, didn't you? I was on at the board. Can you read that, Caleb? Can you read that? Yeah. Well, he can read it, but I guess. <laughs> okay, he can read it. Let me let me ask that correctly. Jeff, ask me. How's that work? How's that work? All right. Would you read that for me? too hard to read but he can read it but it's a little hard so we're okay with that we love it can you guys give him a hand for help? <laughs> so wait a minute god used gideon's weakness for his glory what does that mean i feel weak in different areas so what would happen there caden if god can use gideon's weakness can he use yours Will he? Yeah. He wants us to know when we're weak, he is strong. So what did he do? He went out, and Gideon had this big army, and God said, nope, you got too many. Get only 300, and go out against the mid midnight army numbering 135,000 troops. This is in Judges 8.10. Gideon mustered 32,000 soldiers, but the Lord led him to dismiss all but 300. God wants us to know that we cannot, let's say that, cannot do it alone. He wants a relationship. He wants us to depend on him. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to give our battles to him so that he can defeat our enemy while we stand by and watch. What do we have to do? Well, God doesn't want us to be lazy and just say, do it. He wants us to get involved. He wants us to walk with him. He wants us to do whatever he tells us. But we don't know what that is because we don't listen to him. So Gideon's forces advanced on the Midianites' army, each carrying a torch in one hand and a trumpet in the other. Anybody in here ever been in the military? Nobody? Okay. Jim, when you went in the military, did they give you a torch and a trumpet? 
They didn't? I love the way he's laughing. If we were surrounded right now at the church and I said to all the guys and all the women that wanted to go out there and battle, grab a torch and a trumpet, would you look at me like I've got three heads? Yeah. Because God's ways are not our ways. You know what Gideon did? He took the torch and he took the trumpet and he defeated because he did what God said. When are you going to put down your weapons and pick up God's? What is God's weapon to us? Word. What? Word. The, the word, which is called what? What's our sword? The sword of the spirit is the word of God. So look at those at your table and say, you mean all I need is a, a Bible? Now, I guarantee you, if you go into your word this week and let God change your heart, next week when Jeff says, How's that working for you? How's that working for you? You're going to say, What? Okay, Cheryl's going to say it's working. Nobody else is going to say it. What are you going to say? Jeff, ask him again. How's that working for you? It's working. Great. All right, great. I love it. We can do this, guys, but we need each other. Amen. We need each other. Look at somebody other than someone you live with and say, I need you. That's where I'm part of this church. So why doesn't God work today as he did in the Bible? Well, watch this. God is calling us to join him in his work. God's work is the revelation of himself to his people. And God's call will push us to trust more in him and trust less in oh, That's a hard one. But I can do it. But I can do it. Nick and Beta, how many times does Cassidy say, I can do it? 500 times a day. 500 <laughs> times a day. And what do you do as loving parents? I sit back and let her try and try, and when she fails and she comes to me, then I help her. Yep. She sits back and lets her try and try. Anybody ever been around a little kid, even if they're 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, or 90? <laughs> I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And that's what we tell God. And you know what he does? He smiles and watches you and waits till you're weak enough to let him be your strength. Pretty cool. So we have to start trusting in him. Charles Spurgeon noted, if we only cry the sword of the Lord, Okay, we know the sword's the spirit, and we know it's the word, right? So if we just go, the sword of the Lord, it's going to take care of everything. We are guilty of an idle presumption, and that is the sword of Gideon alone. See, he said the sword of Gideon, but he also said of the Lord in Gideon. We need to go. Not relying on our flesh, that's idolatry. We must blend the sword of the Lord and of Cindy, and of Jim, and of Rosie, and so on. We have to join God. We can't just say, go fight this. He wants us. He wants you with him because he wants you to see his power and his love and his strength. So then what do we do when we see that? We become awed and we start praising him. We're to trust God for only what he can do and then join him by doing only what we can do. See, if we're, if we're out there and we're talking 
evil about somebody and we're complaining and we're talking and then at night we're like God take care of it and nothing happens and then we start to believe the lie you know what I don't have any power in my prayers I pray and pray and pray and nothing happens God wants you to stop relying on yourself God wants you to stop judging his people God wants you to be a vessel of love and proclaim how great he is. That will bring power to your prayers. All right? One, God works in ways. I want you to consider these three facts. God works in ways we don't see. Okay? We have to know his truth and display it in our words all right do you know that the top 17 uh, churches in the world in the world are not in America the largest church in the US is one-tenth the size of the largest church in South Korea did you know that yeah. folks we're sitting on our doves and one week turns into the next, and we're so satisfied with what we're doing and how we're doing it, and we're asking God to do things that we could do and proclaim, and then wondering why he's not when he already has. That's why we're going to get into that book. That's why we're going to know what we need to repent, which means turn from, change, and transform our own thinking. When our minds is, are changed, our hearts will be changed. And when our hearts are changed, our words are going to change. And when our words are changed, we're going to create God's power in everything around us. So if you're not satisfied with what you're seeing, don't blame anybody else. Go inside yourself and go to God and see what you need to repent from. Number two, God works where he's expected. God's truth is in this world, and it will work. But we have to proclaim it and tell others and stop buying in. God goes where he's wanted. So what if we, we talked about the school last week, what if we start inviting him into AJ schools in our prayers? What if we say, God, we invite you into every school in this city and we invite your transforming power to go right into that school and work? Guess what he's gonna do? You're gonna see things happen. Just from last week, we saw things happen. God is working. You better believe it. He's waiting for you to join his crew. All right? So, we can pray with passionate dependence and expect the Lord to answer according to his perfect will. Can we do that? Yes. Why don't we see his perfect will? Because we're blocking it. So, God works where we join him. Noah built the ark. Moses held his staff over the Red Sea. The priest stepped into the flooded Jordan River. Peter preached at Pentecost. John worshiped on Patmos. They did what they could at God's leading, and he did what he could. They led, or, excuse me, he led, and they followed. So if somebody said to you in your heart when you're praying, go build an ark, I wonder how many of us would do it. If somebody said, go tell Lee about me, go let them know what good things I do, and we say, are you kidding? They're going to think I'm a Jesus freak. Well, I hope you are. Because <laughs> he's awesome. He's awesome. But we don't always do it because we're afraid 
All right. So it says, um, the person that wrote this brought, this guy was traveling and they were in a different country and he had a horrible, horrible headache. And of course the country didn't have Advil or aspirin or whatever we use, right? So the pastor says, I'm gonna bring Je Benjamin to you. Benjamin was a hundred year old member of this little church in this quaint little town out in no man's land. And the pastor or the pre preacher had a headache. So he brings this hundred year old man who laid his hands on that pastor and said in the name of Jesus, may you be healed. And his headache went away. His headache went away. Who needs to be Benjamin today? Who needs to stand on God's creative words? Who needs to start doing what God says we can do? We do. We do. Guys, we can't sit back anymore. This world is crumbling around us, and unless we start taking the offense and going out there and making a difference everywhere, it's going to keep crumbling. Stop. Get your armor on. Listen to God. And look for jobs that he's got and get on his crew. We can do this. We can do this. Now, we, I talked about schools last week, and then at the pastor prayer here on Wednesday, we all started praying, and one of the other pastors said, do you know that the 4th of October is bring your Bible to school day? Watch. Hey y'all, it's Sadie Robertson here, and I am so excited to encourage all of you watching this video on something super special to my heart. On October the 4th, Focus on the Family is inviting you to participate and bring your Bible to school day. This could be a huge redemptive story for schools all around your community, and you can be a part of doing this. So sign up right now and register at bringyourbible.org. And when you get there, you're going to see all these different guides and how you can participate. We so want you to be a part of this. It's so easy. All you have to do is choose to be bold and live your faith out in the schools around your area. So churches, we're calling you because y'all are the heart of the people in your community. So bring your Bible to school. Bring God into those tough places. It's time that we go back in and we just live our faith out freely like God always intended us to do. So bring your Bible to school October 4th. And another fun part, if you register at bringyourbible.org, then you get a chance to meet me in person, and which would be so cool and so fun. So go do it right now. And don't forget, bring your Bible to school on October the 4th because this is going to make an impact around the whole nation. And it's really important that as a church, we step up to that calling and create change in our community. So I'm counting on you on October the 4th to bring your Bible to school. Love you guys. So what I'm doing is I'm going to check with the schools. I'm going to check with the schools, and I'm going to see what we can do. I'm not sure yet, but do you know that every child that's in a school is allowed to pray? They're allowed to bring their Bibles. They're allowed to get kids to pray with them, and nobody can stop them. We have been lied to and taught that they can't. They can. Now, the school might be able to keep us from.